Migration is not anything new. Uh, migration has been part of human history right from the start. Uh, paleontologists uh, studying the first hominids, as well as the more recent Homo sapiens sapiens, are busy with the reconstitution of migration routes, their direction and pace. And I think we're all familiar with the maps they produce, with arrows pointing in different directions and covering the globe. Yeah, and actually uh, in the ancient Near East we have a lot of uh, information um, about migration as well. And actually a lot of sources. Uh, it's not only something that archaeologists have discovered, like settlement patterns and changes mm -hmm. in them, but also a lot of textual sources on migration. That's especially because um, they used to write on clay tablets in the ancient Near East, using cuneiform script and clay is very durable material. And, and reading these clay tablets we can actually not only reconstruct the routes where people migrated, but also learn something about the experiences of those people who were settled in new regions. So if we take migration as the movement of population across space, I think maybe we need to be uh, more specific. So we can add, for example, maybe a time element and um, make a difference between short-term migrations, seasonal migrations and long-term migrations. We can also look into the causes of migrations, um, such as harsh economic situations created by climatic factors or political factors. Um, we could also maybe integrate an element of choice um, and distinguish between voluntary migration and forced migration and deportation. So in the case of voluntary migration, it's also interesting to look into the process of decision taking so, uh, of the individual, so how much the social network is actually involved by asking the question who is actually going to benefit from the migration. So I think it's interesting because it really shows on migration that we need some interdisciplinary work to be done in order to grasp the bigger picture. Yeah, I think this element of choice is really important and that's also something we see in the Near Eastern texts. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, forced migration is something we know very well, so a lot of people, perhaps millions of people, were forcibly taken from their uh, home regions to another part of uh, an empire in order to, let's say, advance economic growth or, or make the, the um, peripheral areas of the empire um, more peaceful. But at the same time, we, we also have a lot of information about uh, voluntary migration. So people migrated because they, for example, they were craftsmen, they were soldiers or, or official or, uh, officials and, and, and they had skills and, and knowledge that could be used in other parts of the empire and actually these people were able to find work and better economic conditions when by traveling and moving to another mm. place. I think it's really interesting in the uh, millenniums, the empires of the first millennium BCE, um, especially I find the Neo-Assyrian state seems that it was constantly busy moving people around from mm. one place to another in what can be called demographic engineering really. So, yeah, the question of the scale is, seems to be difficult. Like, estimates range from hundreds of thousands to millions. I think that there's a consensus in the neo and state around 1.5 million, so that's a pretty big amount. It's a pretty big number. So it seems that these displacements happened right after new territories were conquered, but that that wasn't always necessarily the case. And one thing that I personally find fascinating is the fact that you would have been treated differently depending on which social group you belong to. So if you belong to a power holding group, um, may that power be of economic, social, political or religious nature or combination of these, um, then chances are you would have been sent to the heartland. Um, whether that if you belong to a subordinated social group, you could have been sent to a different region, uh, given a piece of land to farm and or employed on a big construction site. So what's really interesting here, I think, is to ask the question, why did the state do this? So what's the state's rationality behind this? One of the big objectives of mass migration was to break up social political structures in order to weaken any opposition to the state. So when you conquer a new place, or when a place that you've already conquered is showing signs of turmoil, or when you have a sense that the power holding groups are getting up to mischief, then the best thing to do is to completely dismantle the social political entity. And once you break the unity of the system, uh, the power of the local nobility is weakened. And so once you've displaced them, then the only power they have left is the power that you're willing to grant them, really. So they become easier to control and more dependent on you. The, the other objective, um, what seems to be the other objective of mass migration is economic and was aimed at maximizing uh, the resources of the state. So the idea is that you'd be given a piece of land to farm, but you'd also become a taxpayer. 
uh, you'd then finance the imperial administration and cover expenses of new war and new expansion and so new annexation of territories. So the system is sometimes called agricultural colonization and it lies at the very heart of the Syrian imperial dynamics. One would like to think that there is a strong continuity from the Neo-Assyrian to the Neo-Babylonian period, but the sources are very scarce from the Neo-Babylonian period in general. But we have one really interesting example on, on which we have a lot of sources, and that's the fate of the Kingdom of Judah in the uh, early 6th century BCE. We know that uh, Judah became a vassal state of the Babylonian Empire, perhaps well, around 600 BCE, but then it rebelled very soon against its um, new Babylonian um, uh, rulers, and, and but that wasn't a really good idea, so the rebellion was, was quickly uh, smashed and, and, and the kingdom of Judah and its capital Jerusalem were conquered. And then a large number of people were deported from Jerusalem and its environs to Babylonia. And, and here you actually see that deportation was a way to, to uh, ensure political stability of a vassal state. But also there was this economic motivation, so people were brought to Babylonia, to core regions of the empire in order to, to uh, have the educated professionals work there, but also bring non-educated non people to the countryside mm -hmm. and, and in, in that way increase the agricultural mm -hmm. output. So you see the same practices and, and, and politics which were already there in the near Assyrian period. I think another um, aspect that's really interesting to look into for both these empires and for other empires in the first millennium BCE is um, to ask the question, what happened once you settled in? So um, we have letters and different types of contracts uh, that help us understand how these populations settled. So the state sometimes not only gave you a piece of land to farm, but they also helped you build a new house. And there's evidence in some cases that officials actually helped find um, some money for unmarried men so that they could find a wife. So basically it seems that the newly settled population wasn't treated as what we could call second-class citizens, but that they had the same rights and duties. So yes, they were subjected to taxes and extraction of labour and sometimes military coffee, uh, but they could also engage in trade, they could earn slaves, they could appeal to justice. And it seems to make a big difference if you were settled in, let's say, peripheral marginal countryside or in big cities. For example, in Babylonia you see that these uh, small communities of uh, foreign uh, uh, peasants who were living in small agricultural villages, after generations they still uh, were preserving their ancient culture, religion, naming practices. So it, it looks like that they had very little interaction with the Babylonian society mm -hmm. and that helped them to, to kind of maintain their Mm -hmm. uh, ancient identities. But at the same time, those people who were uh, deported to cities and who were in constant interaction with Babylonians, they actually quite quickly integrated, they, they adopted local naming practices, they married uh, uh, people from, from local families and so on. Mm -hmm. So quite quickly these people perhaps became Babylonians and started to lose their mm -hmm. kind of, uh, ancient identity, mm -hmm. so to speak. Actually, thinking about um, migration in the first millennium BCE, is, I think it's very challenging. And I think whereas when we're working on these time periods, but also in uh, contemporary uh, time periods, I think that one tends to see migration as a destructive, a disintegrative or destructuring process in which communities conceived as closed entities undergo identity loss. But I think if we suspend the romantic idea of cultural cohesion, and especially the idea that contact between groups constitutes a threat to the reproduction of an identity, I think we can start viewing migration in quite a different way. So if we define culture as a set of dynamic, interrelated symbolic systems, then I think we can see migration as a constructive process, a structuring process in the sense that it produces new social ties, new social networks, uh, this in turn creating new configurations of symbolic systems and new ways of seeing the world. I think that studying how dynamic symbolic systems were impacted by migration and how the very presence of displaced populations impacted the collective identifications that were produced by these empires in the first millennium BCE, I think all this uh, opens up interesting grounds for research. Absolutely.